Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name's Al. I'm usually at church on Sunday morning. If I haven't met you yet, please come say good day. Let me tell you something about your senior pastor. Um, Toby, who's just here, he doesn't believe in recycling. It was about a month ago, uh, we were on the phone, and he asked me could I give a Christmas talk the first week of December. I said, sure, mate. How about I reuse the one that was a cracker on Matthew's Gospel about all the history and everything uh, that I did two years ago? He said, uh-uh. I said, well, John, chapter one, last year, that was great. Can I re- recycle that one? Uh-uh. So he's a hard man, no recycling Christmas talks. I thought, oh, what am I... I think I've found a new one. I've found the Christmas story in the Bible that I've never heard a Christmas talk on and I've never seen a Christmas card that carries this. But it's not a pink and fluffy talk. Uh, So how about uh, I'm going to say a prayer that God would help us to understand his word. And if you'd like to say amen, please do. Okay, our Father, we ask now, please, that you'd open our hearts and our minds to understand your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now here's a... Let's see, Nate, does it work? Oh, yes. Excellent. We're in... That's right, technology. Here's a, uh, here's a Christmas scene, a nativity scene from... Anyone want to guess the movie? The Little Drummer Boy. Okay, and there he is, the little guy in the middle with his back to us, and then there's all the kind of fluffy animals and... It's not a bit like uh, Christian just read to us from Matthew chapter 2. First of all, the little drummer boy, spoiler alert, doesn't actually exist. Uh, There's no fluffy animals mentioned in Matthew 2. And uh, by the time that Jesus is a toddler, King Herod, who really is a monster, has set out to have him murdered. Very different. Now let me read to you from another part of the Bible, a Christmas story that's Well, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've never thought about it as a Christmas story. It's from the book of Revelation. Now, the other word for Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is the Apocalypse of John. Now, when you think Apocalypse, it doesn't mean zombies everywhere and that sort of thing. That's great fun on a rainy Saturday afternoon, you know, B-grade movies. Although, I cannot get Kathy to like um, zombie movies. I don't don't know. Anyway, I'm working on it. No, no, it doesn't mean that. How did I get there? Apocalypse means, the Greek word apokalupto means I reveal. And so Revelation is about God revealing to John what is happening in our world and what will happen in our world. And it uses symbolism like word, pictures, metaphors, numbers, etc. Revelation chapter 12, here we go. This is a Christmas story. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now, almost always in Revelation, when you see the number 12, it's referring to the people of God, 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. So this woman stands for the people of God. Verse 12, uh, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The idea is this great red dragon of great power. That's what the horns and the crowns are all about. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour the child the moment he was born. So it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter and a child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Now, of course, who does the great red dragon stand for? But the devil. There's a, a, a famous painting by William Blake called The Great Red Dragon and you see, of course, the dragon stands with his back to us and the woman that the, who's about to give birth uh, lies in front of him. Uh, William Blake's a painted that around 1800. He was the one that wrote the hymn Jerusalem, um, Chariots of Fire fame, if you've you've seen that. Now, there's a different angle on the Christmas story, isn't it? Hardly pink and fluffy, and yet actually you can see how it fits Matthew chapter 2. Not that King Herod was the devil, close, but not actually the devil, but certainly you can see him being used to try and kill the one who will rule the nations. Now, it is interesting that you don't 
almost, in fact, I, I don't think I've ever heard the devil associated with Christmas, with the birth of Jesus. Although recently I did. Uh, on the 30th of November, I saved the news clipping where this guy, uh, who calls himself Samael Demogorgon, I'm sure that's not what his parents called him. Samael is, um, <laughs> well, Samael is the, one of the evil angels mentioned in the Talmud, Jewish writings, etc. Um, and he's the, the founder of the um, Temple of Satan, uh, so the Nusa, Temple of Satan. And he was complaining in the media uh, that Australia Post wouldn't uh, publish his particular version of a Christmas stamp, which says, um, Hail Satan, not Santa, kids. <laughs> Although I always kind of wonder that Satan and Santa are actually a anagrams of each other. And so I... I won't go there, I'll just get into trouble. Okay. But uh, there he is. Now, there is a man, some male Demogorgon, who is making at least two very bad mistakes. The first one is this. Who, let me go back. The first one is this. Who knowingly signs up to work for the boss from hell? Right? He has. That's a mistake. And the second one is this. If you're a Satanist, you definitely should not be celebrating Christmas. Why? Well, it's all about why Jesus came into the world. And let me show you, to, um, in the next 20 minutes or a bit less, I'd like to look with you at one verse out of the New Testament that's about Christmas. And here it is. And like I say, I've ne this would make a great Christmas card. I've just never seen it done. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The reason the Son of God appeared, the whole reason for Christmas, Jesus being born, is he came to destroy the devil's work. So let's have a look at just two things. Right? What is the devil's work and how does the Son of God destroy that work? Okay, so first point, let's have a look. The devil's work. This is a picture of Mount, let me get the pronunciation right, Mount Quaritania. Uh, it's not far today, uh, today, it's not far from the city of Jericho, uh, and you can go there. It is the assumed or supposed site where Jesus was tempted by the devil. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and uh, was fasting, etc., and then uh, evidently climbed up a mountain, etc., in what would be a great test of his faith and trust in God, and the devil tempts him. Today, you don't need to climb the mountain. There's a cable car that will take you up there and you can have uh, lunch in a restaurant with other tourists. Uh, but look at what it is that Matthew tells us that the devil offers Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, here's the irony. At a certain level, that is actually a real offer. Why? Because the Bible tells us that at a certain level, the devil really does rule our world. The New Testament talks about, well, here's some titles that different um, New Testament writers give to the evil one, the devil. In John chapter 14, he's called the prince or ruler, depending on how you translate it, the prince or ruler of this world. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he's called the God of this age. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Uh, in fact, uh, this whole world will be talked about as the dominion of darkness. Or John writes in his first letter and says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. How is that possible? But notice I said at one level, because ultimately God the creator is in control of everything. But God has given the evil one, the devil, the rule of our world or control of our world as a consequence of us walking away. We believe the lie, we walk away from him and God gives our world into his control. And you might think, oh yeah, but it's kind of embarrassing really. Can you really believe in the devil these days? Well, Hollywood certainly does. Uh, you go to the Wikipedia page and look up movies about the devil. I, I counted 110 different movies that have been made all about the devil. And I see more and more television shows as well about, uh, about him. 
And all around our world, in ancient cultures, people have lived in fear of what? Of evil spirits, of, of the occult, of these supernatural evil beings. And sometimes that even leaks out into our culture. Do you think, well, can sophisticated first world people really believe in the devil? I think if you have eyes to see it, you see it at work. There's so much pain and suffering and evil in our world. And I, I mean, even this morning, I was trying to think about how do I talk to these guys about this? And I, I got up early, I'm sitting there, you know, just um, uh, as I'm eating my muesli. I love to listen to audio books, and I found an absolute cracker on aud Audible. Um, Robert Andrews is a historian. I've just been told about him, and I'm listening to his book called The Storm of War, which is a, a history of the Second World War. If, you, if you're into history, it's brilliant. Robert Andrews, um, The Storm... No, wait a minute. Andrew Roberts, back to front. <laughs> Andrew Roberts, okay. Um, the Storm of War. Anyway, I'm listening. I'm about 10 hours into 27 hours of it, and he's got to the chapter uh, on the Holocaust. And I've actually had to turn it off a couple of times because I can't keep listening to it. Because he actually drills down about Auschwitz and the other death camps and the way in which people were killed and the way in which bodies were disposed. And he gives eyewitness accounts from those who were forced to be the muscle that made all of this happen. And you, you can feel the evil ooze out of it. And that all happened just a few years before I was born. It's like, it's not long ago when you're my age, you feel like, how, how could people do that? I thought, oh man, so I turned it off. I thought, ah, oh, need, need a break. So I've opened up the iPad to go and read one of the newspapers and first thing is an article by a journalist saying he thinks war with China is inevitable. And I thought, really? We're going to do it again? And folks, I'll put it to you, there's something broken in our world. I mean, human beings, sure, we're capable of evil and stuff, but there's just a whole level of evil and malevolence in our world that seems beyond what humans can do. From, from the highest level, like nation and nation, down to tribal, down to, down to poison relationships between people who once loved each other. Now, the Bible says the devil or Satan, it's different names for the same being, is real as a spiritual being and is powerful, but not, not as powerful as God. There's no dualism. It's not an arm wrestle between equal powers. But that the devil is bent on separating humanity from God. Why? Well, I think fundamentally to dishonour God, but also to see humanity destroyed as we're separated from the one who gives life itself. His name, the devil, Diabolos, as it comes as in Greek in the... Um, in the New Testament, means slanderer or, or accuser. Uh, Satan is from an Aramaic word meaning adversary. Now, where did he come from? Why did, you know, where does Satan arrive? The Bible works on a kind of a need-to-know basis. There's all sorts of things we'd love to... It's funny how when you speak on this, there's all questions that people have. It's more like the Bible says, look, this, this thing is real, he's powerful... Stay away from him. But there's a whole lot of questions that we don't get answered. Uh, there's some Bible passages in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, they're Old Testament prophecies, that talk about uh, kings being like a morning star and being cast out of heaven. And people have said, oh, this obviously applies to the devil. The trouble is when you drill down and read it carefully... Um, Isaiah chapter 14 is actually about the destruction of Babylon and Ezekiel 28 is about the judgment on the king of Tyre. It's just the idea of a great one having, been, having fallen and being destroyed. A lot of what popular belief about the devil comes from John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost, which is written in uh, 1667. Now, I need to confess, I haven't read Paradise Lost. It's 10,000 lines long, Okay. So if over the coming holidays you, um, you've got, you know, a day spared, read your Bible instead. Okay. <laughs> you read the Wikipedia article on Paradise Lost, you'll get, you'll get the drift. Uh, now, uh, how do you make it? Well, it does seem like, and once again I say it seems like the devil's a created being, obviously, and that arrogance or pride has been the problem before God. 
So when, why do I say that? When the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he writes about choosing people to be leaders in the church. He says, be careful who you choose. Why? Um, Chapter 3 verse 6 he says, he, the potential leader, must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. It's that idea of pride. That pride before God, it's all about me, is what the problem was. As I said, there's no dualism in the Bible. It's not like an arm wrestle between two powers. God's ultimately in control and the devil's like a dog. Yeah, sure, it can bite you, but a dog on a leash, it can only go as far as God will allow. And ironically, even the devil's, as you read carefully, even the devil's opposition to God means that God's plans come true. As he, um, for example... Uh, the devil leads Judas to betray Jesus, so Jesus will be murdered. Yes, but ultimately that brings about God's great victory of making forgiveness possible through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, what is the great... Okay, so that's that's a picture of what, what or who he is. What's his great weapon? Well, in those 110 uh, 110 movies about the devil... um, you know, back in the 70s with the exorcist, etc., it was, uh, you know, head spinning around, green vomit, and it turned to be little ladies speaking with voices like Darth Vader and all of that, and then whatever the latest CGI version is. Um, in the New Testament, you get Jesus in a kind of hand-to-hand uh, struggle with, or not really struggle, he hand, individually casts out evil spirits out of people that have begun to control them, yes, um, But you could say that's actually the unusual work of the devil. The usual work of the devil, the most effective work of the devil, is with the lie. You say, oh, that seems a bit kind of mundane. I think, yeah, it's because you don't see it. That's why it works so well. Jesus says it explicitly in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says this, You belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, it's no surprise, in that same chapter, John chapter 8, Jesus says, the truth will set you free. The weapon of the devil is the lie. What Jesus brings is the truth. I thought about, I made a little list, I've got about six or seven of um, the devil's most effective lies at the moment. Here we go, Let me, uh, I'll read you a few, see if you've heard them, you might think, yeah, if you follow that rabbit down the rabbit hole on that lie, you can see what happens. First one, we are simply the result of blind, indifferent laws of physics and therefore we are simply hairless apes plus time. Some people believe that, or... The way to happiness is to put yourself first. Or, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Or, this is a popular one, human nature is basically good, we just need to educate people. Or, if you look at the history of the 20th century, both communism and fascism are built on lies about human nature, who we are as people, and lies about God. You can see the damage that those two um, belief systems have done. Or here's one from uh, Hollywood. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Right? From uh, the movie The Usual Suspects. And that's partly true as well. Lots of people say they don't believe in the devil. Or I guess the devil, what's he do? Well, simply distracts people with the latest bright, shiny thing. Like kind of who has time to think about anything we're busy chasing whatever it is. But the greatest lie of all, you'll see in Genesis chapter 3, so brilliantly explained. You get the picture where the man and the woman who represent humanity and the snake or the serpent that represents the evil one. And what's the lie? The lie he brings is this. God doesn't really want what's best for you and God doesn't really know what's best for you. So if you disobey him and make your own rules, you can be like your own little God. And doesn't that lie come to us every day? Does God really know best? Does God really care? I'm going to do my own thing. That's the lie. And of course, Satan not only 
uh, lies but blinds people to the way to be forgiven and to know God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. It's like in Jesus' story about the four soils when um, uh, the seed lands on the path and the birds come and snatch it away. He says, that's the devil. The people hear and the, and the devil snatches the word away before people can truly hear it. All right, that's the works of the devil in brief. Second point. So how does the Son of God destroy the works of the devil? Well, it's interesting. If you read a gospel, let me go back. If you read a gospel uh, and look for it, Jesus frames up his mission as bringing the kingdom of God, right? God's rule in the hearts of his people and so on. But that immediately brings him into contact with or conflict with another kingdom, the kingdom of the evil one. So here's the way Jesus puts it. Um, after he's you know, cast an evil spirit out of somebody, uh, he says this, uh, Matthew chapter 12, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Notice says the devil has a kingdom, right? He rules. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The two kingdoms in conflict. Now that, that conflict with the evil one, it happens particularly when, when Jesus is there teaching and preaching, but that's really just the... Uh, um, the opening round or the, the entree of the whole thing. We get to this, back to those 13 words. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. How does that work? Remember one of the names for the devil, one of the translations of the devil is the accuser. Now how does that work? What gives the devil his ultimate power over humanity? And that's this, it's our guilt God is just and a judge and God must punish wrongdoing and we all do wrong stuff. We ignore God, we do the wrong thing, we break his laws, we mistreat other people and, and God's justice says someone has to pay for that. And so the accuser points at humanity and says guilty, guilty, guilty. That's what gives him his ultimate power. And what's the answer? Well, the only way that God can forgive us, the only way that anyone can forgive is you have to absorb the wrong yourself. You think about it, if someone's done the wrong thing to you, why is it hard to forgive them? The answer is this, instead of hurting back or instead of handing out justice, you have to suck it up yourself. Right? And so what happens, God says that he will pay the price of forgiveness himself. Now, where does the Bible say that? The book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Listen, this is the, the heart of what I'm trying to get across today. Hebrews chapter 2, 14. Since the children, meaning the children of God, right? Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, meaning Jesus, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. There's another Christmas talk, actually. You see that? Right? He shared their humanity. He's born white. Um, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. He, Jesus paid the price of forgiveness. That's God paying the price of forgiveness himself so that we can be forgiven and he can still be just. That's what it's all about. And so if you, if you belong to Jesus, if you trust him, you need not fear God. You need not fear the guilt of the past things you've done. Why? Because you're forgiven. And it takes away or breaks the power of the devil. Now, the devil's defeated, that power is taken away, but things continue with him still, uh, you know, trying to wreak havoc, but there will be a terrible judgment day. And folks, really, when I, when I said this isn't a pink and fluffy Christmas talk, for example, in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says this to those who don't know him. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, he says this, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And that is the end point of those who have ignored God and God's offer of forgiveness and the end point for the devil.
and those of the, his angels. So, two kingdoms and no one is neutral. A lot of people would be just happily cruising along, just pleasing themselves, not, not giving God a second thought, uh, not thinking about the devil, whatever. Yep, da, 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 that's great, except you're actually in the kingdom of the evil one, Jesus says. In fact, to become a Christian is to change kingdoms. Um, the Apostle Paul says this in his letter to the Colossians. He says, for he, um, God, for God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, there's one kingdom, and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. That's what it means to become a Christian. All right. I think I've got um, five things that are troubling as a result. Here you go. Right. If you accept what Jesus teaches, firstly, our world is a spiritual war zone. Secondly, it's fought especially, that war will be fought especially in the basis of lies or truth about God. Third, no one's neutral. You're in one kingdom or the other. Fourth, most people happily living life, ignoring God, believing the, the lies of the evil one, are in his kingdom. And fifthly, it actually takes the kindness of God to open people's eyes to see who Jesus is and to see forgiveness. Now, even when, even when someone does follow Jesus, there's still the temptations. And the Bible has warnings about the evil one. Don't it says, don't fear the devil, but be alert, right? Um, so in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He doesn't say be afraid, he says, but be awake, right? And it is the, the temptations of the evil one will always be sugar sweet. They'll always be sugar sweet. And then James, if you like, is the other, the other bookend on that. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, submit yourselves, then to the, sorry, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Meaning what? In that struggle, in that testing, walk towards God and believe him. So happy Christmas. And uh, <laughs> I wonder if you think hard enough about this, it might change the way that we do think about Christmas and what Jesus has come to do. And just how, how brave and, and strong he is. And so, I ask the question, which kingdom are you in? For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Uh, we're going to have question time in a little while, Nick. Yeah? Terrific. Um, how about you pray with me, please? Dear God, we thank you so much that you sent your son into the world to destroy the devil's works. Thank you that he paid the price of forgiveness. I ask, please, that may, we may all come to know the life and love and freedom that Jesus won at such great cost. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen.